Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 193 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I have the good fortune to spend an hour or so hanging out with Ian Burrell, global rum ambassador and co-founder of Equiano Rum, a new brand that's turning heads in the cane spirits world with their innovative blends and mission-driven focus. But... Before we start tasting rum and learning about the mysterious art of blending, let's give you a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Missionary's Downfall. I decided to feature this drink because many modern recipes for it include light or gold rum, which is something we'll spend a good amount of time on during the interview, and because there are a number of ways you can go about preparing it. To make the Missionary's Downfall, you'll need one ounce of light rum. We, of course, recommend tracking down a bottle of Equiano light rum. One ounce honey syrup, one half ounce peach brandy, one half ounce lime juice, a quarter cup diced fresh pineapple, a quarter cup mint leaves, and three quarters of a cup of crushed ice. This build is for the historically faithful version of the drink developed by none other than Don Beach. And it does require a blender because we've got some solids in here that need to be dealt with. But the nice thing about going this route is you can just chuck all your ingredients in there, blend on high for about 15 to 20 seconds, then pour into a large coupe glass and enjoy. Now, let's talk about some of the problems with the missionary's downfall. First, peach brandy. Who's got that sort of thing lying around? Not many people, so if we imagine ourselves into the inevitable substitution game most of us will have to play, I'd recommend swapping out the peach brandy one-to-one with any sort of stone fruit eau de vie. That's an unaged, unsweetened fruit distillate. Or you can cut your honey syrup in half and use something sweetened like a peach schnapps, for example. The other problem, of course, is if you like the flavors in this drink, but you don't own or want to clean a blender. In this case, everything I've said so far applies, but you can substitute your diced pineapple for one to two ounces of pineapple juice, maybe take down your honey syrup a little bit so that the drink doesn't come out too sweet, and then proceed like this is a shaken cocktail. Muddle the mint in the bottom of the shaker, add your liquid ingredients, then shake and enjoy in a highball glass with a straw primary color in the missionary's downfall is green the blended version comes out a verdant hue from the blender and whether you're pursuing the blended or the shaken version i'd recommend garnishing with a pineapple frond and a sprig of mint so now that you've got a complex and ridiculously refreshing cocktail to explore with your next bottle of light rum let's turn our attention back to the interview In this eye-opening conversation and rum tasting with Global Rum Ambassador Ian Burrell, some of the topics we discuss include how Ian entered the rum world as a bartender, which led to several career transformations as a brand and category ambassador, then the creator of UK Rum Fest, and now as one of the co-founders of a blossoming rum brand. The fascinating life of Alauda Equiano, slave turned entrepreneur turned freedom fighter and philanthropist. He, of course, is the namesake of Equiano Rum and the inspiration for both its products and its philanthropic mission. How rum from the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean is blended with meticulously distilled and aged spirits from Barbados to create the unique flavor profile and multicultural DNA of Equiano's flagship product and its brand new light rum, which I had the privilege of tasting before it even hit shelves here in the U.S. We discuss the impact of colonialism and geographic indications on today's rum landscape. We explore the exciting emergence of multi-style or multi-island rum blends, the difference between nursing and doctoring a drink, how Ian plans to convert Barack Obama into a rum drinker, and much, much more. This 
if you couldn't already tell, was incredibly fun to record. It won't take even five minutes for you to understand why Ian is an ambassador, not only for his own rum brand, but for the entire spirit category. And when you're in the room with somebody like that, it's best to just sit back and let the magic happen. On that note, it's my pleasure to present this wide-ranging conversation with bartender, educator, and entrepreneur, Ian Burrell. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. So we're going to taste some delicious rum here. We're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about blending. It's going to be a lot of fun. But before we get into all of the specifics, can you just briefly introduce yourself to our audience? Tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, so my name is Ian Ian Burrell, and I'm the global ambassador for the category of rum. And um, I've been doing this for quite a quite a few years now. Um, the only one in the world still, <laughs> um, but um, also now one of the founders of a, a brand new rum called Equiana. Fantastic, fantastic. Obviously, there's been a lot of buzz around Equiano, a lot of excellent publications, um, sort of writing to introduce the world to this rum. And uh, I'm very, very excited to taste it. But you mentioned Global Rum Ambassador. And Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk before we get to Equiano about what a Global Rum Ambassador does. I mean, did a did a voice appear to you out of a burning bush? Did, uh, <laughs> did, did Poseidon rise up out of the sea and, and d- declare you that like, how does one become a global rum ambassador? Yeah, it's pretty much something like that is like the rum gods. They, they spoke to me and it was like one day, uh, I was actually down in uh, New Zealand, um, back in 2003 after I'd been working for a couple of years as a brand ambassador. In fact, the first and only brand ambassador, um, for a Jamaican rum in the UK. And it was while I was down in New Zealand talking to other bartenders where I realized, I'm like, I'm getting paid to talk to other bartenders about rum. And the only difference between myself and them is the fact that someone is crazy enough to pay me to do this. <laughs> and I'm just talking about something I'd do for free. I didn't tell them I'd talk for free. And I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. Um, yes, I love making cocktails. I love being behind the sticks. But if I can just travel the world and talk about rum and get paid for doing it, then it's not really a real job. And uh, that's where the journey started. So I know that there are some rum trade organizations like WERSPA. Um, Correct, yes. If you are engaged in the act of being an ambassador for multiple different rums or perhaps even multiple different categories of rum, who pays you? Is it WERSPA? Is it you know <laughs> nations or like, I don't know, how does one get a gig? Well, well, first of all, um, when you are um, uh, a self-declared or, or um, a rum ambassador, you have to seek work. You have to, first of all, build a credibility. And it was through that credibility of uh, and word of mouth that people recommended me that Worst Bar actually approached me to be a spokesperson for them. So I was a spokesperson for Worst Bar for a couple of years. Um, this was back in like 2009, 2010, when they were in the early stages of promoting authentic Caribbean rum in the in the in Europe. So yes, yeah, so I've I've been there and done that. But in regards to things like going on to represent countries. Uh, and and organizations that has come through word of mouth that has come through reputation where I've been approached by um, government organizations to talk about rums from those specific regions to represent them and help them actually try and put a um, create a footprint um, in the world of rum uh, just by putting them in the right places so um, it's just through recommendation and by reputation uh, a passion and a love for what I do. For sure, for sure. And that passion certainly comes out. And I imagine that's one of the things that led you on to sort of the next big item on your resume, which is UK Rum Fest. So yeah. can you talk about when you got the idea for this type of event and what it was like orchestrating it, I guess, for the first time and I suppose subsequently? Yeah, well, I mean, um, when I first started to travel to learn a little bit more about the rum category on my own dime, um, going to the Caribbean, you'll see a lot of these foodie events and uh, and they'll always have rum connected with them. So they became like mini rum festivals, but you would only showcase the local rums. And I said, it'd be really great if we could recreate this on an international stage where you'd have rums from all over the world, just like whiskey festivals, beer festivals, wine festivals. So when I came back from St. Lucia, Back in 2005, I, I put my mind to it. That I wanted to try to create a rum festival here in London. Um, and it took me about two years to get the first one up and running. Um, took all my savings. I actually had a deposit to buy my first house. Used all of that. Lost most of that after the first event. 
Um, but it wasn't, I didn't lose it. It was more of an investment. I invested and created a brand. Um, but I really wanted to really create a platform for the rum category to really showcase um, that rum was more than a spirit. It was actually a way of life. And that was the mantra back in 2007 when I created that first World's International Rum Festival, which has gone on to spawn rum festivals all over the world now. Um, so it's been, a, I, I feel so privileged to actually been been there at the start of creating that journey for a lot of different rum brands. Yeah, I think for any brand ambassadors who are listening, that's the difference between a brand ambassador and a global ambassador is that the global ambassador is willing to stake his uh, his his home his home buying savings on on the event. <laughs> literally did, literally did. People thought I was crazy, and they were like, "Why? Who's going to come to a rum festival? Why?" Um, oh. but wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one of those uh, cro those crossroads uh, sliding door moments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite activations or events or maybe just uh, shining moments from the rum fest over the years? Because, you know, I think a, lo a lot of people have either been to like a whiskey festival or something like that, or can imagine at least what one is like. Um, what are some of the high points for you uh, from UK rum fest? Um, well, the first one is, I, I would say is the fact that people started to look at rum um, in a premium sense, because, the word premium and rum was an oxymoron. Um, you, rums were cheap that you just mix with your favorite mixer because all the most popular rum brands were cheaper uh, or more affordable. All the expensive premium rums were stuck in barrels waiting to be sold or they'll just get used up in, in younger blends. But now we're starting to see some rums that people are looking at and saying, oh, this tastes like brandy. Oh, this tastes like whiskey, uh, which back then I was like, yes, as a compliment. Uh, now I'm like, no, no, it tastes like good rum. <laughs> but um, back then it was like the only way to get rum onto that ladder of, of premiumization was to have it being compared to the scotches of the world, the bourbons of the world, uh, the Irish whiskey, well, not so much Irish whiskey back then, but the cognacs of the world. So, so that for me was some of the high points when I saw people sip and savor and taste the rums in that light where they were drinking it neat. One of the other really funny points was when I saw this little old Jamaican lady and uh, she had she'd grown up with rum like myself and uh, she was tasting an Australian rum for the first time. Now she hated it. She said it was disgusting. But the fact that she'd learned that there was rum made in Australia was was why Rum Fest was created. It, was, it showed that rum was a multi, multicultural spirit. It was made all over the world and it had this different interpretation. So it was really nice hearing us spit it out with disgust, but at least finding <laughs> out, at least discovering that rum was made in Australia uh, like a beloved Jamaica. Oh my goodness. You know, as you were describing that, it occurred to me that, you know, how comedians almost when they're up on stage and they're getting people laughing, they almost get a high, they get a head rush from yeah, yeah. executing that. And I mm. think for people in our industry, like one of the cool rushes is seeing that realization happening, that recognition, seeing something almost break in someone's brain when they taste something and then like it gr something new grows out of that. And, and yeah. you can literally see it happening right in front of you. And the most gratifying times are when that happens, when they actually have the liquid in their mouths and they're actually tasting. And so I, I, I love that you were able to so like deftly communicate that. And, and for, for people out there who haven't experienced it, just try and introduce someone to something new that you love and that they might not know about. And, and you'll, you'll sort of understand it. It's a really cool rush that is certainly one of the perks of, of doing what you do and to a limited extent doing what I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of the reasons why I still love bartending because it was that it was that ability to be behind the stick and and someone coming to your bar and saying, "Entertain my palate, uh, give me something that I'm going to enjoy, give me something I'm going to learn about," and you introduce them to something new. Um, part of part of my my teachings that I my old bar manager first taught me was I had to learn three drinks and three stories or pearls of wisdom for every bottle behind my bar. And that would be the conversation piece if I'm making a drink, especially for a customer on a quiet day because they could sit in the bar and I could talk to them about that. But when, as you was describing, that penny dropped that you'd mentioned something that they were like, wow, I didn't realize this. It was like even more reason to want to give them even more information. And of course, they want to tip you as well because you re they realized that you weren't just a person behind the bar. You was a uh, professional. Um, mm -hmm 
with all these spirits behind uh, you and uh, those are your tools and so yeah it gave that professionalism of and those pearls of wisdom that you gave to a customer as that penny dropped when they drank that particular cocktail or drink for sure for sure and and your bartending background just before we get into your current project here mm -hmm. um when did you start in bars and you know, like what what has your bar trajectory been i guess from from the get-go I, I started in the early 90s. Um, I took um, some time off of school. I was supposed to go to drama school, um, actually one of the top drama schools in London. Um, took about six months off. My best friend said, let's go and work in a bar. And I was like, yeah, yeah OK. And he talked me into it. But after after a few a few weeks working behind a bar, making drinks, having fun and getting paid to have fun, I didn't really want to do anything else. And, and they say once a bartender, always a bartender. So although I'm, I'm a little bit older now and I leave it for the younger younger kids to be behind there making drinks, I will do a every now and then a guest bartending shift. I now do more guest drinking. Um, so that's where I'll, I'll create a menu and then sit sit by sit behind the bar and have a drink while the real bartenders <laughs> work in their bar and I'll just promote their menu or promote the menu we've created together for that particular evening. But um, yeah, so once a bartender, always a bartender. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well. You have a really exciting project on the table right now. It's literally on the table in front of me. Very oh, wow. shortly, it's going to be in a glass in front of my face. Nice. Uh, it's called Equiano Rum. And I was hoping that you could back us into this by starting at the beginning. And feel free to correct my pronunciation here. But who is Aluda Equiano? Oh, right. I mean, Aluda Equiano or Aluda Equiano. It depends on who's pronouncing it. I'm, I'm not actually from West Africa, um, so I, I could be pronouncing it wrong, but most people say Aluda Equiano. Um, so so Aluda Equiano was a freedom fighter. He was an abolitionist. He was an entrepreneur. He was an author, a writer uh, from the mid 18th century, which was when he was born. But it was it was that time um, of being a young African at a time where they were seen as a commodity. So he was enslaved um, when he was 11, taken from West Africa to the Caribbean to be sold there. He wasn't actually sold in, 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 in the Caribbean. So he then went on to the Americas uh, and from America, he was then sold uh, onto the ships and ended up in the UK. And when he ended up in the UK, that's where he learned a little bit of uh, how to speak English. Um, because he was young at that particular time, he wasn't thrown onto, say, plantations. He was actually like a cabin boy um, as such on the ships um, and adopted by an, um, a family. He then went back onto the ships and really learned about um, being um, a navigator, seafaring. But when he came back to the Caribbean um, as a young as a young boy, he then saw the travesty of, of the enslavement of Africans and it was shocking to him um, how, how they were treated, the, the brutality of it. And he vowed to fight for freedom. He vowed to basically put his mind to try to change all this. But also there were other teachings and things he picked up. And one of the things he picked up was from a guy named Robert King, who was actually um, his owner at that particular time. And he said, if you can raise, you can raise 40 pounds, which is about 50 bucks. You can raise 50 bucks, you can buy your own freedom. And but Robert King wasn't the type of person who was just saying that just for um, just just for, for the words. He was saying it because he was incentivizing him. It was a say it was a way of I'm going to try to help you better yourself because uh, that's he was a Quaker. So they believed in that. So, um, yeah, and, and he did it. He uh, in three years, he uh, in a, he raised and saved enough money. He paved his way to freedom by doing things like selling rum. <laughs> he sold rum in the islands. Um, and that that raised enough money to buy his own freedom, went back to the UK. Um, basically, uh, he he got other people around him to see what was happening um, in, in, in the colonies and wrote a book, The Interesting Narrative of Allow de Recreano, which became a nine time bestseller in his lifetime and informed the public, informed America, it informed the UK, it informed the colonies and, and helped with the abolition of, 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 of the Slavery Act in 1807. So, he was an important person in inequality for all people. And, but it's a story that doesn't get told. Uh, I, I heard about it when I was young, but not in school. It was basically on weekend schools that I was forced to go to by my parents at that particular time. But I'm glad they did because that's where we learned about that part of history. And um, I just felt it was, it was it'd be great to, to pay homage to him, put his name on the bottle, tell that story, but also have a, a spirit with a cause and he was a, a, a massive connection to the cause for why we created the brand that we now call uh, Equiano. Yeah, I think it's important what you say when you mention that 
a lauda equiano tends to be a footnote as opposed to a feature in history textbooks because Correct. i remember when i was in high school in my history textbook for american american history or just generally the history of that time period it is exactly what it was it was on a little sidebar a l- little paragraph with right. uh, a picture of of his autobiography wow. and and that's about it you got a few sentences about him and it, it didn't i really don't think communicate his importance um you know especially having conducted my own research prior to this interview i was like mm-hmm. oh wow like this guy was he was in a lot of places right. he met a lot of people and he yeah. was sort of at the nexus of a lot of very important ideas yes and yes. um just a few things that I came across in my research that I, I wanted to mention. It seems like the Quakerism connection was fairly important for 100%. the abolition movement. It um, was hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you naturally, if you was a a person of faith um, and had that belief, it would you'd wrestle with the fact that if somebody is supposed to be seen as equal to you, then how can you be treating them as a sub, uh, someone who's lesser than you. How can you be treated like an animal? How can you be abusing them if they're supposed to be seen under your God as equal? So of course that would wrestle with your own ideals. And uh, and I think the the, the true Quakers uh, believe that yes, there was profit to be made, of course, from other things connected with the enslavement of Africans, but true Quakers believe that all men and women, well, I'm not sure about women at that particular time because women were also fighting for their own thing at that particular time, but was should all, all people should have been seen as equal sure sure and then equiano uh, here in here in america we had this project or it was it was both colonial and post-colonial right, and okay. pre-colonial all at once it was called mm-hmm. liberia and i believe right, yes i yes. believe the uk had its own sort of a similar project that equiano was also involved in right yes. the idea being that hey, we have these people who were ripped from their native home. Mm -hmm. And now as a country who has, you know, sort of seen the light, we're going Mm -hmm. to try and and create an independent nation for these folks. And there was also a project in the UK like that. Is that correct? Yes, there, there, well, there's many, many projects like that. And and some of the, the, a lot of these projects actually led to the independence of a lot of the ex-English colonies, um, although some people say it may have, it may have happened too late um, or not, not, not quickly enough. I mean, Jamaica, where my parents are from, gained independence in 62. You had other countries gaining independence around the 60s and um, early 60s of that particular time from Ghana, uh, sorry, uh, Guyana to Barbados, uh, Trinidad and places like that. But um, I, would, I was going to say good things come to those who wait, but things things happen for a reason and things uh, all good things will happen in time and in due course and with the independence of a lot of these countries the independence of a lot of these states and with people like uh, Laudere Carano back in the early 18th century um, and in the 19th century pushing and fighting for that before he passed away but then his legacy there was then passed and the torch was carried by other people we are progressing we are progressing some people say it's not happening quickly enough but we are progressing as as, as humans um, in that respect, some people might look and say, well, that person isn't, but <laughs> there's always going to be exceptions to every rule. <laughs> every That's rule. right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, I'm going to crack into what I hope is some exceptional rum here. Oh, and uh, you've, got I'm the Equiano you... light. you've got the Equiano light there. Huh? I do. Oh, I do. Yes. Do you have the original at all? Uh, I don't. I have oh! three bottles of the light. Oh, no. Oh, no. We're going to have to get you some of the, uh, the original because the original is is for me the uh, the quintessence of what Equiano is. Well, I'll, I'll just get some of the light as well. All right. Um, I mean, I'll, I will touch a little bit on the original first before we go into the light. The original oh, was- the original, As much as you want. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, well, the original was created because when um, I was challenged by my business partners to come up with a concept and an idea of a rum that would be slightly unique, because of my ethnicity in the UK, I'm African Caribbean. I say, well, it would be good to do an African Caribbean rum. So I'm always talking about Barbados rums and Jamaica rums, and Martinique rums, Puerto Rican, Cuban rums. But um, we never really focus on other areas, um, especially in the UK. Um, and Africa, of course, as a, as a continent, has an abundance of sugar cane as well as raw material, but no internationally noted rum brands. So I've been very fortunate to work with a few countries in the African continent from Mauritius to South Africa, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, some of the best liquid coming out of the continent was coming from Mauritius. 
And so I wanted to blend some of that Mauritian rum that I knew would taste good with some Caribbean rums that I knew was exceptional. Um, and that's how the, that's how the rums got together and the African Caribbean blends got together by blending um, some rums from Mauritius with rums from Barbados. So that's how the original, um, the original liquid concept came about. And then it was about perfecting what style of rums we wanted and how we were going to play with those flavor profiles. Mm -hmm. um, now, as a bartender, as a rum drinker, there are so many different interpretations of rum. So the original is a, uh, a medium bodied, uh, darker rum. Uh, it's a blend of rums that have been aged for a minimum of 10 years in cognac cask in Mauritius, which is blended with rums aged in once used bourbon cask or American oak um, in Barbados. And that blends together to create the original. The light was created because we wanted to make a lighter alternative for bartenders, for that home bartender and for the rum drinker that wants to have a lighter gold rum for a different style of cocktail or different type of drink because not everyone drinks rums neat. Some people want to try rums with their favorite mixer. And when people say to me, is Equiano a sipping rum? I say, no, it's a drinking rum. <laughs> you drink it. <laughs> I'm saying, well, how do we drink it, Ian? Any way you want to see fit, whether it's in the, with your favorite mixer in a cocktail, have it neat, a uh, couple of cubes of ice, any way you want. So that was the orig original. The light, I wanted to try to be slightly different as well again. So again, using Mauritius and Barbados, um, different proportions. But this time, instead of actually using two rums made from molasses, which 90% of most rums are made from, we wanted to use a rum that had fresh sugarcane juice inside there. So Mauritius as an island has been um, colonized by first the Dutch. They went there um, in the early 1700s. Um, they ate all the dodos <laughs> as well. So there's no more dodos. That was their, that was their legacy, eating all the dodos. And then Dutch. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then, then they were, but they also brought sugar cane to the island, which was a good thing in that respect. Uh, then the French came there. Um, they had the island. Uh, and then the English came to the French and they had a little bit of a fight, as, as the English and the French love to do. And then in the Paris Treaty of, I think it was 1819, when they, uh, the English and the French tried to divvy up the whole world, the English said, all right, we'll take, um, no, the French said to the English, you can have Canada and we'll have um, Martinique and Guadeloupe. <laughs> English are like, oh, Canada's quite big, but they didn't realize Canada was cold. <laughs> and Martinique and Guadeloupe was amazing island. So the French, <laughs> the French, the French are very happy. And the French also said, you can also have Mauritius in the Indian Ocean as well, because you can use that when you're on the way to uh, Asia. So the English took Mauritius and Canada and the French kept Martinique and Guadeloupe and some of the other French departments. So, so the, and so that leads on to the style of rum that's been created on the Isle of Mauritius. There is the influence from the French um, colonies, there are influence from the English. The English bring uh, the use of pot stills and the old way of making rums, alambic stills and molasses. And the French are bringing the column still and the fresh sugar cane juice, uh, which they call agricole in Martinique and Guadeloupe. So Equiano Light is a blend of rums from molasses and fresh sugar cane juice. Molasses from Barbados, fresh sugar cane juice from Mauritius. It's a light rum, a light gold rum, not a white rum, uh, because the rums have been aged for a minimum of three years in American oak in Barbados, but the fresh sugar cane juice rum is unaged and that's blended together to create a an interesting profile on a light rum. So I'm actually gonna pour one out for myself. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's the, the sugar cane juice goes through a column still, is that correct? Correct, yeah, it goes for a single column still. Um, slightly different from the column still they would use in, say, islands like Martinique or Guadeloupe, because they use what we call a Creole still, um, where in Mauritius they're using a traditional column still. It has about, I think it has like 32 plates, and they are using molasses instead of fresh sugar cane juice. So you're getting a different type of distillate. It's coming off the still at 95% alcohol by volume. Um, and then it's watered down to be used in either aging in barrels. So what I always get is really light, fresh aromas, but I get a lot of the cane coming through. I get that oh, earthiness, yeah. that earthiness, like a bit of earthy. Um, uh, some would say, I was, sometimes I, I, I feel it's like a, a putty, like a wet putty type. Oh, interesting, and, and I, interesting. And I, and, I, and I get that as well from some cachaças that have been rested, uh, aged lightly and rested. Um, one of my friends actually said it reminds him of Reposado. I'm not sure if it's because of the color, because of the look, 
But um, I think it was the earthiness that they got from there. And I was like, oh, we'll stick it in the fridge and do a shot and tell me what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Being a uh, I get I get a little bit of almost uh, what what you might call petrichor, the the after a fresh rain. Wow, so, you okay, know, it's, yes. it's the blending of the I get the earth, of course. I'm I'm yes. smelling the, the earthiness that you're describing, but there's also that. I mean, cane is a grass, yes, right? Yes, of course, correct. So I'm, I'm smelling that. It, there's almost like a humidity to this that I'm smelling, and that's it's, a great description. It's very transportive. You don't mind if I plagiarize some of these descriptions you're giving me? <laughs> oh, please do, please do. Uh, I love that. Um, yeah, and. Um, it's and it's because of that 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 perfume and that aroma which lends itself to the styles of drinks which it was created for, um, because it, it is light. A lot of people will feel well, it's it's going to be a mixing rum, and there's nothing wrong with mixing rum. So I don't see it as a detriment when some people say, oh, well, I'm going to mix this rum because it means you're going to use it as a base for an amazing rum experience. Whether you're, uh, I love this with grapefruit juice. I love this with coconut water. I love this in a highball. Um, doing tonics with different types of twists. So, so twists of grapefruit. Uh, uh, I was in a tasting with this in Italy recently. Well, not in Italy, online in Italy. And they were talking about the oily components of it. So they were talking about it's quite balsamic. Um, and I was like, wow, I didn't even, yeah, you're, I, I, get, I get where you're coming from. So now I'm thinking of savory things I could pair with this, like thyme and basil and, and, and other types of uh, Mediterranean spices and herbs and that's what we wanted for a, a rum like this to give a lot of different types of flavor profiles that you could then um, enhance when you're making a cocktail or a, or a, or a simple serve. Yeah, this is on the nose. It's quite remarkable because with a lot of light rums that I've nosed and tasted in the past, one of the things that comes through is almost always to me the vanilla or butterscotch. Yes, and, yes. And that's that's okay. Yeah, right? it's okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's fairly mainstream. Like I, I've come to expect it now. And so when I see somebody like you with a new project, I, I see it as a bit of proof of concept that you are presenting me with something that breaks that expectation. Correct. Yes. And right. uh, and you're you're so right. The 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 default for some of the lighter rums is that vanilla note that they'll get from, especially from American oak that they were aging in, because they want to try to bring some of that in. Now for the lighter rums that don't have color, most of them have filtered through charcoal to take that color out to become water white. And I don't, I don't understand why they would want to do that because, I, well, I do understand because some people look at water white as the definitive of a, of a white rum or a light rum, but there is so much flavor you're losing by doing that charcoal filtration to take that color out. Why not leave it in there and leave it as a light rum to play in different areas for different styles of drinks. And that's why I love citrus and rums and the different variants of diverse citrus, because you can use 10 different types of citrus with this and different types of sweeteners and make 10 different types of sours, whether it be daiquiris or sours or such. And you're making completely different drinks because of flavor profiles you're trying to draw from a young rum that is tropically matured. So even though it's only been aged for three years, that's three years in Barbados where you're losing six to eight percent of your liquid every year compared to say Scotland where you're losing two percent of whiskey. So that's a lot of maturity for three years in a 200, 220 liter barrel um, of American oak once used bourbon cast. And so there's a lot of flavor coming there. And then the fresh sugar cane juice, of course, you're getting all of that natural sugary notes, fermentable sugars, yeast, fermenting for like two days and all of those flavors are now blended together with that age rum and that's what we have here with uh, the Equiano Light um, bottled at 86 proof. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about proof. 80, 86, 43 mm percent. -hmm. Uh, I would I would say it, it drinks a little bit warmer than that. It drinks a little bit like a like yeah. a 90 proof to me and uh, oh. I think I think that's this is something that I've been paying much more attention to very recently is, is looking at the proof on the bottle, forming some sort of expectation about what I expect that proof to do hmm. when it comes to my trigeminal sensations, right? The, yeah. the sense of, of warmth in my mouth, in my throat. And I think it's something that people can do. Like once you you've gotten comfortable with nosing and tasting, I think, you know, taking a second, 
gathering your expectations and then trying to see if the rum meets those expectations or somehow mm. defies those expectations. So yeah. I don't know. It's it's something that I've been exploring a little bit more. And I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing that yeah. this drinks like, to mm. me, a, something a little bit warmer than, than 43% ABV. Yeah. It's just a data point. And Correct. taken together with all of the information that you're giving me about the sourcing about the history of Mauritius with this split British and French influence. Like this is all, this is all information that is allowing me to take this from a liquid to a friend mm. in my mind. I'm trying, you know, yeah, I'm trying yeah. to create a relationship with this liquid and all of that plays into it. So that was a little, that was a little rant on, on tasting <laughs> and how, to, how you relate to your drink. But, but anyway. it's a brilliant, no, but what you just described there so eloquently, it was like a brilliant way to understand tasting because it is, really subjected and personal to each individual even down to the glassware um, that you're using and even down to how long you've had the rum sitting um, open and opening up as well because uh, you can have something with more alcohol inside there but if it's been sitting for say 20 minutes in a warmer environment and it's had time to settle and and some of the the, the volatile alcohols like to evaporate it's going to drink completely different from if you just open it fresh and it pour that same product into a glass and start drinking straight away so it's, it's like warming your friend up, um, warming it up for an occasion to, to drink and to talk to them. And um, it, it's it's funny, one of the one of the descriptions of drinking rums we have in Jamaica, there are two ways. There is a nursing a rum and nursing a rum is when you take a little sip and you take your time and you nurse. It's like even nursing someone to help. And the other one is a doctor a rum. And, it, and when we say Jamaica, doctor a rum, we just drink it. Yes, don't even mess around. Just drink it, doctor it, doctor it. So it all depends on who you're drinking with, how you're drinking, what you're drinking, whether you nurse a rum or you doctor a rum. But you could be drinking the same rum and it will drink a completely different way because of how you doctored it or nursed it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're like me, here are some things you might be like. You live in the mid-Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is local, sustainable, and comes from ethically raised animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need Near Country Provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages, and also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART, all one word, at checkout. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, at checkout. Near Country Provisions is the real deal, and I can honestly say that I'd recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. I, I want to quickly return to the Equiano original, which yes. is obviously the the offering that most people are going to be familiar with. Uh, yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. The, the light is a, is a very new addition, right? Yeah, very new. You're actually one of the first people in the United States to actually taste taste this product. Um, we've only just uh, only just landed in the UK uh, about three weeks ago. No, sorry, two weeks ago. Um, in the states, there's only been small samples sent out. Um, so yeah, so I was I was pleasantly surprised when you had it because I thought we were going to be going into the original. So we'll have to do this again now with original. But um, yes, it is fairly it is definitely new to the to the US. So going back to the original, uh, talk to me about a gentleman named Richard Seal and and why this was a decision <laughs> that became important to uh, the original expression. So uh, so Richard Seal, uh, if, if 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 anyone knows uh, rum, and when I talk about rum, I talk about geeky level. Richard Seal is seen as the best and most awarded rum maker in recent times. Um, he's a bit of a maverick. He wears his collar, or he wears his heart on his sleeve when it comes to describing and talking about rums. It's about rum should be as pure as possible, unadulterated. Uh, it should all be about um, the love that you put into making a product and what it delivers from the cask you use, the type of distillation, the source of your sugar, um, whether it's molasses or cane juice. Um, it is about doing it right. That's, in fact, that's a motto on his um, distillery. It says, "We do it right," and 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 rightly so. He's been awarded the top awards over the last four or five years um, to be seen as the best rum maker in the world. Fortunately, I I, I, I have him as a friend, a really good friend. Uh, we drink together. We we disagree on on things. We laugh and joke. 
uh, as such, him being Barbadian and me being a Jamaican, there's a big rivalry there as well. Um, the friendly rivalry, I suppose it's like America and Canada. Yeah, that friendly rivalry, I think, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, we, we definitely have it in the Caribbean. Um, so one of the things people said to me, people say to me is, why didn't you use Jamaica as the base for Equiano being a Jamaican, a proud Jamaican? And I said, well, I, I will do one day. There'll be some Jamaica rum in an Equiano blend because we want to be seen as some of the best blenders in the world. But if I want to try to make a rum, first of all, seen as an amazing example of premium spirits. If I want a, a rum that could go on the lips of all the three main types of rum drinkers, which is the geeks at the 1%, the rum influencers at the 9% who can call brand uh, a particular brand, or just the general public, which includes a lot of people that don't care where the rum is from, as long as it tastes good, and they still think some spice rums are rums. If I want to make sure a rum that will appeal to all of those, Barbados is one of those places you have to go to because their rums are so versatile, not as um, acquired, like a big, heavy ester bomb, like a, a Jamaica rum, which I love. But again, it's something to go for an acquired taste. So that's the reason why I went to Richard and said, listen, Richard, I've got an idea for this this rum. Where I want to blend some rums from, from Africa with your rums. He said, let's do it. I was like, wow, OK, <laughs> no, no, no haggling, no like, no, no like, oh, I've got, I'm busy on this. He's like, no, let's do it. I was like, wow. So we did it. And I, I created some blends in my kitchen, um, tasted those and said, this is what I want. Expressed it to Richard and he delivered. He delivered the liquid that um, I'd imagined what Equiano could could be like. And uh, and yeah, it's a lot of people have, have put the thumbs up. It's won. It's in, in the two years we've been in existence. We've won every single gold medal or competition we've entered in um, as a gold medal from the International Wine of Spirits to the oldest in the world, which is the International Spirit Challenge. So, um, yeah, so it's it's a decent blend. <laughs> to say the least, to say the least, wow. Uh, I really like the point that you just made about choosing Barbados as one of the anchor points for your, your main expression, because you're right. When I think of the far ends of flavor experience and rum. I think of course of, of Jamaican Hogo. Yeah, yes. Of course correct. I think of, you know, Guiana. Yeah. And yeah, of, of course. course I think of Martinique, you know, yes, these are yes. all, these are all very specific styles and, and, uh, Barbados is, Barbados is remarkable in its history, of course, uh, but, but also in just like the ethos that I feel like Barbados has is one of very, like it, of consistency. Correct. And and yes. and craftsmanship and yeah. it, it's it's not extreme in those same ways, but it is extreme in its own ways. Uh, and and so it's it's cool that you were able to uh, get with Richard to to produce this and and ob obviously with the Foursquare and, and the stuff that they're oh, yeah. putting out, it's it's yeah. just it's second to none. I've had the chance to taste through a few of a few of the single single barrel uh, expressions that came out of there, and it's 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 just a special experience. So for anyone who gets the chance uh definitely keep your keep your eyes out for for those bottles they're they're oh, yeah. still remarkably actually affordable in many cases yes yeah, some of them are i mean because richard is um well the four square especially exceptional cast range that he's done has been likened to um the pappy van winkle of of rum so there are some that's still affordable and there are others that are now being being flipped by um rum rum speculators because they are uh, limited edition. When when you have a rum or a spirit that everyone's talking about that it's doing so well, and you only have twelve thousand bottles for the planet, then you know that a bottle is going to go up in price, triple, quadruple in price overnight, pretty much. And and that's where Richard has positioned um, some of the four square rums that he's created. But also um, another reason why we did go to Barbados because again you were talking about introducing your, your, your uh, and having a friend in the conversation while you're drinking rum and Barbados is the home of rum. It's the place where rum got its name. Yes, people were drinking and making spirits from sugarcane a hundred years, even longer before Barbados, but it was that island where the word rum was used to associate with that sugarcane spirit that was made in that island. So that is the home of rum. Um, and, and, here, and the funny thing is when when I approached Richard to create this blend and do the blend with me, and we decided to create an African Caribbean rum, we didn't have a name. It was almost like we started a conversation about the rum gods calling me and saying, Ian, rum ambassador. It was almost like Equiano 
called us and said, hey, what about me? I, I was taken from Africa to Barbados, to America, to the UK. That's the same journey our rum makes. Our rum is taken in barrels from Africa on a boat. It's painstakingly and expensively sent to Barbados, where it ends up at Foursquare. It's then blended, married with Richard's rum, bottled at Foursquare, and then some is sent to the US and some is sent to the UK. So it makes the same journey as a Lauda Recreano made um, as such. And we did all that or planned most of that before we actually had the name. So it was almost like it was a calling. Yeah, it's wonderful when the name comes to you, isn't mm. it? It feels it feels much more yeah. intended that way. It feels yeah. it feels uh, very full and very fortuitous. So that's a that's a wonderful story. Uh, I'd love to talk about the future of Equiano and yeah, maybe sure. a little bit more generally the future of rum. But before yeah, I did that, I, I wanted to give you the chance to uh, just rep your team and, and uh, talk a little bit about who else is doing this project with you. Yeah, sure. So um, there's four of us uh, inside the, the Equiano rum uh, company. So we have Aisha. Um, Aisha is like my little sister and uh, we battle all of them with each other. Aisha is brilliant. She's um, she runs a creative design company. So a lot of it, a lot of the design, the bottle shape, and even down to things like um, the the Q uh, on the Equiano label is a Q from Equiano's original book um, from the 1700s. So smaller details like that. The Tampa seal, which I used to, I fought with her. I was like, oh, I don't like that Tampa seal. Now I love it. It grew on me. And that's going to be part of our feature, the different types of uh, Tampa seals that we use on different Equiano blends. But yeah, she is. She sees and uh, she analyzes and sees a lot of details uh, in the company. And then we have um, Amanda. Amanda actually got us all together. Amanda's background is the music industry, and she was the one who was like, "Oh, we should do uh, an African rum." And I was like, "Oh, well, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, we, nice idea, but there's no liquid in there that's really going to really take you to that next level." But she knew all all, all three of us um, independently before we all got together. And then there's Ollie. Ollie again worked with Amanda, a music, music background as well, into marketing, and he's in charge of sales uh, around the countries, uh, sorry, around the world. So all four of us all get together. We all bring something to the table in bringing Equion to life. And, and the thing is our company, again, reflects our audience. Uh, there's four of us, two men, two women, two, two people of color, two white. And, and that's how we lead, that like to see our company. That's how we like to see our audience. That's how we see the world uh, having that balance um, as a company. So yeah, very proud of, uh, of, of the team, the Equiano team. And, uh, and one of the other important things is when we sat down to actually form the company, one of the first things we said, we have to have some um, philanthropic, what's called, uh, we have to have a philanthropic mindset. We have to be able to create and make a difference. Uh, we have to be able to give back. And that's one of the reasons why we said once we've made a profit, 5% of that profit will go to groundbreaking charitable organizations. Uh, this year it's um, Anti-Slavery uh, International, which is the oldest uh, international anti-slavery uh, organization in the world. But until we make a profit, we're giving $2 and two pounds for every bottle we sell uh, from our website. And um, because we've done incredibly well, we've cut a really nice check for the first check um, for uh, Anti-Slavery International. So, um, and if you go into our website, you can see what the, the projects we're working on, but that's again, what we wanted to do as a, as, as a, as a, as a crew, uh, as a company, uh, even more so than create an amazing rum. Yeah, that's really special. As you were describing both your team and also the, the process that your rum takes on its, on its life journey in, until it hits the bottle. Uh, it it occurs to me sometimes there are rums that seem like they're almost like s kind of not stuck in place but, but firmly grounded in place. I think you know I think the the Jamaicas of the Jamaicans, the Martiniques, uh, the ones that I just sort of uh, identified the the Guyanese with their their ancient wooden stills. Uh, and it, it seems like what you've accomplished is is a rum that has a, a greater sense of of motion where it's it's almost like it, it's it's sort of designed to to move a lot and to go a lot of places and and I think that really aligns with uh the impact that you're that you're trying to have and and uh you know the, the company culture and breakdown that you just described so I, I think in that respect uh you know hearkening back to Equiano himself who who moved a lot and and met a lot of people and and affected a lot of lives I think it again just works really perfectly uh but what I wanted to maybe wrap up on here was the I, I guess 
perhaps new trend, maybe you can correct that, but the, the newish trend of people trying to make rums that are blends of different countries that are kind of far away from each other, or at right. least very different in style. We mm. have 10 to 1, which I'm sure yes. you're familiar with. I am, very, uh, yes. That, that's doing, doing a lot of work in that space as well. So do you see this trend as being one that's going to continue to grow in the rum world as, as people are looking for uh, new ways to experiment with what rum is and can be? I think we're going to. Um, I, I can honestly say when when I was coming up with ideas for Equiano, uh, even before I come up with uh, ideas of Equiano, I was looking at other spirit categories and seeing what were what were the popular, uh, what were the most successful brands out there and what they were doing. And when you have a single origin, um, you're, you are at the mercy of the rules and regulation of that particular origin or that area. Um, and there are some great products, as we know, when we think of cognac and tequila, scotch whiskey, um, say Kentucky bourbon or Tennessee bourbon as such. Um, but when you have the option of blending different styles within your category, you then have a different type of palette to play with as an artist. Um, now, that is done within one region or even one distillery because, I mean, you speak to some whiskey drinkers that drink single malt. They don't realize that a single malt is blends of different styles of whiskeys from one single distillery. Um, it's just because it, they don't think it's not a single barrel. It is lots of single barrels blended together and each barrel will age and mature differently. Now, why can't you get those barrels from different regions and blend and create? a la, say, let's Johnny Walker, one of the best liquids out there on the planet, the range of Johnny Walker. And they're not single malts, but they're blends of single malts or blends of blended whiskies that have been put together masterfully by the master blender. And I'm saying, well, why can't we do it with rums? Uh, the Royal Navy used to do that, but they did it out of necessity. They did it out of where we have to buy the cheapest rums available, or we couldn't put all of our eggs in one basket, so we couldn't just buy rum from Guyana or Jamaica or from Trinidad because if there was something that happened in that particular country or island and we couldn't get stock, we had to have a blend or a product that we could bring in from other islands to put into our, our, our blend. So that was an out of necessity there. And also is from a business sense, you wanted to cover your corners, cover your bases. But we are going to see, and answer your question, we are going to see a few more interesting plays on, on different styles of rums. And I always equate it down to bartending. I always used to say to people, how many bartenders, how many cocktails do you know that are blends of different vodkas? Uh, or the base is blend of different vodkas, or the base of blend of different tequilas, or the base of blend of different gins. But if you look at like, say cocktails from the 1930s, created by say Don the Beach, you look at his recipes, there would be Jamaica blended with a bit of Puerto Rico, blended with Cuba, blended with Guyana, uh, blended with Santa Cruz or St. Croix. Um, they were all different styles of rums that brought different flavors to the table. So you could blend three different rums to create one flavor profile. And that's what we're, that's what we're looking to do with Equiano. And that's why I, I feel we'll see a lot more of these multi-island or multi-area area styles of rums blend together. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you've tasted uh, the first rum I ever drunk when I was growing up, which was uh, this rum, Ray and Nephew Overproof. <laughs> 63% or uh, 126 proof, being a Jamaican. It was the first time I had a sip of this when I was about four days old, according to my grandmother or my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of Jamaican. But one of my favorite daiquiris uh, they used to make inside my bar was, um, I would do like an ounce and a half of, of Bacardi, uh, Carta Blanca, which some people say, well, it's quite light. Yeah, it's a Puerto Rican style rum, it's very light. But then you do half an ounce of Ray and Nephew added to that. And then give that a good shake and serve that with an ounce of fresh lime juice, and um, half an ounce of, of simple syrup, maybe a couple of dashes of orange bitters just to give it a little finish. But the 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 the, the, the pot still flavor of that Jamaican rum was enough just to change the whole complexity of the drink. But because you're only using half an ounce, it doesn't hit you between the legs <laughs> like a full <laughs> two ounces of Ray Nephew you might do in a cocktail. So there we will blend in two different styles of rums to make the base of a cocktail. So it, it, it stands to reason that you could blend different variations of rums to create the base for your particular rum blend. Um, so yeah, I, I think we will see a lot more of those in the future. 
I love the impulse to look at the cocktail world and then take your cue from cocktails because usually we think of like, well, what are cocktails made of? They're made of spirits. Yeah. Usually we think of cocktails as being subsidiary to the spirits that are yeah. used to create them um, in terms of who is the original and then who who comes later. Yeah. But this is yeah. really interesting. I love the the idea of rum blending in cocktails as, as a way to think about the project that you're doing. And, you know, in terms of I know that there are some people out there who really adore the geographic indications and, yes. you know, it, there's something nice about geographic indications in that when you have a box to play within, there's also a great amount of creativity that can come from the limitations around you. And so 100%. this is not, this is not to say that there's still not any value in those geographic indications, but I think that with the the prevalence of some of these blends like Equiano, like 10 to one that are hitting the market and, and making a big splash in the rum world. I think what that allows us to do is, is reflect on, you know, what each of these, if you can, if you can actually, if, if, if you're transparent and it mm -hmm. seems like everyone so far is being fairly transparent about yes. what is actually in the blend, yeah. you can, you can maybe see if you can disassemble that blend on your palate and see like, Correct. well, Correct. what influence is the Jamaican or the Barbados bringing to this? And what, what influence are maybe they coming together to yeah. create? Like yeah. what is more than the sum of its parts? And so I see the project of creating these multi-nation or multi island or multi-region blends as being one that actually enhances and gives validation to the geographic indication system oh, because it, it showcases it so well but it just showcases it in a different way than we're used to and i think that's that's your job and my job it's yeah that's okay well, this is a this is a basis of a uh, this is the basis of a seminar because uh it, we very rarely get a seminar based on that based on the justification or why we why a gi for various different re for different areas would benefit from a multi-island product because you're right you could have um and again this would be a nice little exercise to do to have a blend of rum or a, uh, or three different rums with from three different regions with different ratios of those regions inside the product you would have three different rums and it, then then you can really pick out all oh, the wow that i'm really getting the jamaica and this one here and i'm not getting so much maybe of the barbados or or even the martinique if it was like jamaica barbados and martinique but in a different ratio you're getting a little bit more of of maybe the um the cane juice coming out if it's a martinique in that blend so that would be a really good exercise to actually do and a, a great basis for a talk of bringing hmm. out that but um but i do love i love the fact that you highlighted that a gi gives these it, it's just it's it's about protecting but you still have within the parameters of a gi still an amazing amount of um ways to express yourself because if anyone says gi is stifling i just say look at look how much different types of scotch whiskies there are out there um and then tell me that it's stifling because <laughs> i i'm not a massive fan of isla i appreciate them but give me a space side anytime and they're both scotch whiskies mm -hmm. so <laughs> Precisely, precisely. Well, Ian, I want to thank you for um, for sharing the, this rum with me. I'm uh, I'm super honored to be one of the first recipients of the light. Yes, and, yes. and I got to say, man, like no nonsense. This is one of the best light rums I've ever had, if not oh, the man, best. Thank you. It's, oh, thank it's, you. Um, I, I, I tend not to be a huge fan of them because in so many cases, they try to straddle two worlds but don't do a great job existing in either Correct. world yes and here yeah. i think the remarkable uh product is is because you're able to kind of like tie some of these processes and the history of mauritius in with yeah. some of the incredible work that richard's doing at mm -hmm. foursquare so yeah. um it's 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 a fantastic product i i do recommend that people keep their eye out since it's just hitting the market it's going to be a little while before our american audience sees it on yeah. shelves but yeah being about about two i think it's about two or three weeks maybe maybe towards yeah towards the middle of june is when you'll see the market but uh, we're very fortunate we've we entered it cheekily entered it into two competitions the san francisco and the international spirit challenge and won a gold medal in that as well with, the, with this particular <laughs> rum so we're like wow didn't expect that but that's um, fantastic yeah. uh equiano original is that available pretty much in everywhere in the US? Pretty much everywhere in the US as in uh, online, um, because as you know, the United States of America is 50 different countries <laughs> and each country has its own law and regulations, but we're, we, we're taking our time. So we're only going to focus on like about six to seven uh, states. But um, but if you do want to buy online, you can get on, yeah, you can just Google Equiano Rum uh, and there are, there, there are 
companies that will uh, sell the rum to you, uh, to your door in uh, all 50 states um, in America. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, uh, Ian, do you have time for a few lightning round questions? Oh, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. I like lightning, light rum, enlightenment, journey of enlightenment, <laughs> which is what we put in the bottle. We like little subtle things. Subtle little stories behind each bottle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the first question here, I'm a, I'm I'm curious to know because you're a bartender. Uh, what's yes. your favorite cocktail of all time? And if you don't have a favorite, what's something you've been more recently obsessed with? Uh, my favorite cocktail has to be a daiquiri. Um, that is quintessentially the the trinity, the rum trinity of rum, lime, and sugar. Um, yeah, it just really showcases what a rum should be like. So yeah, uh, a daiquiri and heritage wise, it would be a rum punch. <laughs> Because everyone in the Caribbean thinks that makes the best rum punch. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I would not want to be uh, sitting around that table when, when the debate comes comes up. Oh man, yeah, it's a serious debate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this this might uh, dig up a little bit of your past, but uh, as as a former basketball player yourself, All right, yeah, um, yeah. We've got the U.S. Uh, NBA playoffs coming up here, and right. uh, so I, I don't know if you have a a favorite U.S. or international player right now that, that you'd like to uh, um, to share with us. If we're talking about present day players, um, I would probably have that. And it's probably gonna. But I know he's got a lot of haters, but I'd have to say LeBron. Um, uh, it's not so much about his athletic prowess; it's about his basketball IQ for me. It's how he plays the game, how he brings other people into the game and makes other people around him better. Um, he would be an amazing person to play with as a basketball, as a teammate. Um, so that's what I love about um, him. And the fact he's got some great numbers, of course, as well. But I just think he's just all round, all round great basketball player. Mm. What about past players? Past players has to be Jordan for me. Um, I, I grew up in there seeing Jordan, seeing some of the stuff that he did. Um, and when I look at today and say to myself, could Jordan have played in today's era? Probably even easier because you weren't allowed to you weren't allowed to hang off his arm and grab him and pull him like the bad boys did of Detroit or getting beaten up like New York did. You couldn't do that. Can't do that nowadays. Today, if you look at someone, it's a foul. <laughs> so, yeah, <exactly. laughs> or you're rolling around the floor for 80 seconds because you got poked in the eye, LeBron. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Jordan for me, um, again, just absolutely amazing. But um I love watching basketball. I love watching exceptional players. And there are about 50 different amazing basketball players. I just like to watch old highlights. Everyone from Magic to, to Bird um, to Kareem. Um, yeah, there's uh, some amazing basketball players from back in the days. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I love watching basketball as well. It's my favorite sport to watch. Oh, right. Okay, yes. Uh, and yeah. and I, I enjoy playing as well, but haven't been playing much this past year. And um, I'm unfortunately a Celtics fan, and they're, oh, they're circling the drain right now a little bit yeah. this year. But uh, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> circling the drain. <laughs> it's always, always next year. It's always next year. Uh, next question. If you could have a cocktail with anybody, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us your ultimate picture. Wow. That's a, a, a tough one, only because there's so many people you'd love to be able to sit down and have a drink with. Um, I suppose from a personal, recent personal point of view, probably Barack Obama. I would love to have sit down and have a drink with Obama for several reasons. One, because I know he likes vodka. I have no idea why somebody wants to drink vodka. So I need to convert him. I need to convert him from vodka into rum because why, why? Secondly, he's, we share the same day, same birthday. So he's an August 4th Leo like me. Um, so uh, when I see some of his, some of the things he says, his mannerisms and the way he sees life, I, I, I see myself there as well. And I use that as an inspiration. Um, so yeah, Barack Obama, I would love to um, have drinks with. Um, I would squeeze in Michelle as well because behind every great man is a great woman and I know she would be great to sit down and have a, a have a run with. So I'll squeeze her in as well because Barrett's the main person. Michelle's because they're there, couple. Um, Confucius. I would love to have drinks with Confucius because uh, some of the things he says and some of the quotes that have been used over the course of time, I'm like, wow, this guy was saying this or it was interpreted that way. And it's so applicable to today's forward thinking. Um, and that's how I've applied my life. And when I do look at my job as a global ambassador for rum, and I, I still think it's a crime um, that I get paid to do something that I'm passionate about. And Confucius did say, if you find a job that you're passionate about and you never have to work a day in your life, 
and sometimes I don't feel I'm working. It's this is something I, I love doing. I enjoy. Um, and again, there's so many people in recent times in, in, in the spirits industry. I mean, I'd love to see people that have passed away um, that I could just have drinks again with that always bring a tear to my eyes when I talk about them. People like John the Mayor, Thomas Esters of recent. Um, I mean, I'm welling, I'm welling up now just talking about them because uh, they were great friends mm. as well. Um, but um, <clears throat> uh, but someone like Fawn Weaver, um, you're going to hear a lot more about Fawn Weaver, um, mm -hmm. the CEO of Uncle Nearest um, yes. Rum. Uh, so I call it Uncle Nearest Rum. Freud didn't slip there. <laughs> uh, Uncle Nearest <laughs> Whiskey. <laughs> um, this woman is just... Uh, uh, amazing inspiration and i say you're going to hear a lot more about her you're going to hear a lot more about her in the next couple of weeks and uh something connected with equiano as well but um she is just another person that i love her drive i love her dynamic i love how she's taking on the industry coming from a place not within the industry but still appreciates the values and the ideals that we have um creating brands working as bartenders working um on the floor within the the catering business um, and respecting that um, so she's coming come for come from outside the industry as a historian, mm -hmm. taken it on board and brought Uncle Nearest to the world. It's a, a story that not, not much people knew about. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so that would be my, my that would be my dinner table. I, I would I squeeze sorry I squeeze on a few more people around there <laughs> with the drinks <laughs> with the drinks. But um, yeah. yeah, that's that's what I'd like like to have have drinks with if it was that's baked to that today. That's awesome. Of course, Fawn and Uncle Nearest, uh, very similar project to Equiano in terms of the storytelling and, and yeah, the, yeah. the ties to heritage. And so, so it, next time you see her, uh, we'd love to have her on the podcast. So put I'm a little gonna, bug in her ear. I'm, I'm going to put a little bug in her ear. I was just texting her this today and said, give me more inspiration. So I'll send a message to her. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Uh, so wrapping up here, do you have any unusual or controversial views in the spirits or cocktail space? Um. Well, I wouldn't say it's controversial. For me, it's common sense. Vodka, why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. Sorry, premium vodka, why? Uh, uh, that, that is an oxymoron, premium vodka. You're now paying a premium for something that is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Think about it. That's nearly as bad as, I don't know if you, do you have Evian water in the States? Mm -hmm, we do. I mean, just reverse Evian. What's Evian say backwards? uh and Na naive uh, naive <laughs> correct there you go people are paying a premium for evian water how naive can you get that's the same as uh, we're paying a premium for for a for a premium vodka just get a cheap bottle of vodka stick it in a premium bottle and sell that well some some bars do and they got fined for doing that but anyway mm. but yeah that's probably the most controversial i i, I think uh in other spirits industry <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I the the rum the rum folks do tend to uh, have a pretty hard stance on vodka and and for 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 good reason. So yeah, we'll have to uh, it up. Well, well, Ian, this has been fantastic. Uh, can you just wrap us up here by telling people where they can find you and Equiano Rum in the digital world? How best to reach out and say hi? Yeah, I mean, you can find me um, on, on Instagram, just the, the Rum Ambassador. <clears throat> nice and simple on Twitter. It's the, the with a D A as in D A rum ambassador Ian in as Ian Burrell, um, <laughs> on Facebook, nice and easy Ian Burrell or Ian rum Burrell. Um, and Equiano, um, our website is Equiano Um, or you can go to the Instagram page and have our Instagram person talk to you like he's the brand <laughs> or she's the brand. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's just a, a Instagram slash Equiano rum. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Ian, thank you for uh, the storytelling. Thank you for uh, your time. I know you have an entire globe that you need to kind of spread <laughs> out in your schedule. Uh, and thank you, of course, for the uh, the wonderful rum. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have to make sure we get a bottle of original to you um, so you can have a taste of that and you can say, oh, wow, Ian was, I thought Ian was like a pull in my leg. He was uh, actually talking some serious stuff about the flavor of uh, the original Equiano rum. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I'd, I'd love to have it. So uh, thanks again for being a guest on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And uh, let's hope we can do it again soon with the new Equianos.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here. And by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed. Delicious rum, history, and craft insights courtesy of Ian Burrell and Equiano Rum, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.